Hello. Please, could the permanent secretaries that are accompanying Madam please come to the high table? Dr. Ngozi. Hello. Madam, please sit there. Good morning, um, my, my colleagues. Uh, the, as you can see, the, our guest for today is here, the Head of Service of the Federation, Dr. Mrs. Olashade Yemi Esso. She is in our midst now, and she, as she makes her way to, the, to our seat, let us get prepared to begin the event. Please, Madam, you can come up. May we all be seated. The Head of Service of the Federation, Permanent Secretary is here, uh, Chairman PCT, my colleagues, distinguished members of the press. In continuation of our briefings coordinated by the Presidential Communication Team, today we have in our midst the Head of the Civil Service of the Federation, Dr. Folashade Yemi Yeson. Uh, I think we can boldly say that one of the areas where the
us, gentlemen of the press here and other stakeholders, on the major milestones and strides made so far by our office to support the President Buhari-led administration in its vision to deliver a world-class service for accelerated national development. As Madam comes, you know our drill. She will talk to us for about 30 to 40 minutes. After we will take questions from gentlemen of the press here and from some of our stakeholders who are watching us on YouTube and this program is also live on MTA. On this note, I would like to invite the head of service to talk to us. Usually, she will mention that. Maybe not take the thing off her feet. <laughs> Good morning, very distinguished ladies and gentlemen. It is a great pleasure to be here to talk about what God has helped us achieve in the office of the head of service. And you know that one man cannot achieve anything. So God has placed very good men in the office of the head of service who are driving the strategic plan of the office. So I'd like to first of all introduce the permanent secretaries that are in the office of the head of service. Can you please stand up to be recognized, all the permanent secretaries? Thank you. Thank you. I will talk more about them as we go on. Thank you, Sude. Also with me this morning are the very dynamic directors in the office of the head of service. Please can you rise up to be acknowledged also. Thank you very much. Please sit down. I also have here the administrator of the Public Service Institute of Nigeria. Please can you stand up for recognition. Thank you very much. As I go on in the presentation, you will see and um, notice the roles. Each one of the people in this team have been, what they have been doing to ensure that we succeed. The Office of the Head of Service, let me just give you a little background this morning about um, the Office of the Head of Service. But I also, before then, profoundly thank his, the President, His Excellency, for the opportunity to present what the Office has done and what we are still doing to support the laudable ongoing reforms projects and programs of his administration. Now about the Office of the Head of Service. The Office of the Head of Service of the Federation is structured into five offices. I wish to note that each office in that office is similar to a ministry and is headed by a permanent secretary who is the administrative head with very, very distinct functions. This slide shows us the five offices. We have the Common Services Office, we have the Career Management Office, the Service Policies and Strategies Office, the Service Welfare Office, and the Special Duties Office. So that is the structure within the office. We also have some agencies and parastatals which the office supervises. One of them is Public Service Institute of Nigeria and the administrator is here. We also have the Administrative Staff College of Nigeria that we all know as ASCON and also the Federal Government Staff Housing Loans Board. In addition to these, we have the six federal training centers um, that cater also for training of staff. 
Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, it is often said that the Nigerian public service is the engine room for national development. It is the government organ through which the state executes its plans, policies, and programs. Therefore, the service is expected to remain an indispensable instrument of change and development with the urgent and pressing need to bring about rapid fundamental socio-economic transformation. It also follows that in trying to position the service, the Federal Civil Service has gone through a series of reforms just to reposition the service to work effectively. And the, the last attempt this administration went through was the civil service, Federal Civil Service Strategy and Implementation Plan. We had a first one that ran from 2017 to 2020, which we called the FC20. And then at the end of 2020, we developed a successor plan, which is the Federal Civil Service Strategy and Implementation Plan 2021 to 2025. In the first plan, we had eight prioritized um, projects. But in this second plan, we have reprioritized and we have six pillars of the plan. And we did this in consultation with a multi-stakeholder review of the first plan. We did a lot of review of the first plan, what were the successes, what didn't we do very well, and how could we forge ahead better. And we came out with a second plan. And so the, su the successor plan, which is the FC25, will run from 2021 to 2025. And it was approved by the Federal Executive Council on the 15th of December 2021. And it's important to note that this plan is aligned to both the National Development Plan, 2021 to 2025, and it is also aligned to the nine priority areas of this present administration, which concerns the Office of the Head of Service. Now, this plan is aimed at evolving a crop of skilled, motivated, disciplined, innovative, and performance and merit-oriented civil servants. It is expected that this will change the negative perception of the Nigerian civil service and lead to effective driving of the Nigeria's socioeconomic development. And so in developing the plan, we took cognizance of some very important elements. The first one is that we wanted, or we did a high impact prioritization of interventions that can be launched in the short time and drive immediate impact in the service. We also speci dealt specifically with actionable and detailed implementation plans for rollout. We also have a costing for the whole plan and we also ensured that we listed all the resources that we need for the plan. There's also a very clear governance structure to drive each of the pillars and to drive the reform in all to ensure success. Also, we ensured that we looked at partnerships. We saw that it's not possible for the federal government to be able to roll out this on its own. So we ensured that we got adequate partnerships to support what the federal government is doing through the plan. And we got private sector NGOs and donors to work with us. In addition to that, we came up with a very clear change management strategy because all other plans we've had has not dealt with a clear change management strategy. But this plan has accompanying needs 
a very, very clear change management strategy because we want to change from the old service to the new civil service. And this change strategy is embedded in the plan. Lastly, there's also a monitoring and evaluation framework for tracking the implementation of the pillars of the plan. Therefore, this presentation will provide updates on what the Office of the Head of Civil Service of the Federation has done in the implementation of programs and activities under the six pillars of the Federal Civil Service Strategy and Implementation Plan 2021 to 2025, which we popularly call FC25. And the pillars, like I said, you can see the, the building we are trying to build with the very strong six pillars. I'll just mention the six pillars um, briefly. The first one is capability building and talent management. The second is performance management system. The third is integrated personnel and payroll information system, the human resource part of this. The fourth is innovation. Fifth is digitalization of content in the service, and the sixth, but also very important, maybe the most important, is staff welfare and enhancing value proposition for civil servants. It is also important for me to point out that the Office of the Head of Service of the Federation is decentralizing the implementation of FCIP 25 and permanent secretaries in each MD are uh, supposed to drive the implementation of these six pillars and give regular reports to the Office of the Head of Service. This is to make it um, more localized. Instead of us driving it from the Office of the Head of Service, the permanent secretaries are driving it from each um, MDs. Gentlemen of the press, ladies and gentlemen, as explained earlier, the FCIP and its six pillars are tailored to re-engineer the service for increased productivity and quality service delivery. Now I'll go to the first pillar, which is capability building and talent management. To achieve our aims, we have lined up a number of programs and activities to drive this. The first one is that we're training a presidential cohort of 100 in-service professionals annually. And before we commenced the training of these officers, we had to redesign their modules for training and relaunch those modules. And so we have a cohort of officers that we call the lead P officers. We also have the smart P training. This training is for everybody and it is for all officers from grade level 7 to 17. And it's important to note that the modules for training of these officers are different based on the grade levels. So we've disaggregated the trainings um, across board. Another thing we're doing is the mandatory induction training to ensure that there's some onboarding of fresh entrants into the civil service. We want to make sure that they know what the culture is and how, what we expect of them in the civil service. We are also training officers for conversion to planning officer cadre. We discovered that there's, we don't have enough planning officers in the service. And since there's an embargo on employment, we put out an internal advert to try to recruit people who are interested to become planning officers. And we got quite a number 
of people. So we've trained some of them and um, we've deployed some of them. In addition, we also are developing the capacity of chief executive officers of parastatals. Um, we got approval uh, to do this because we discovered that most of the CEOs don't have any form of training before they take up responsibilities of running their agencies and parastatals. And so ASCON was tasked with the responsibility of training CEOs at the point of um, announcement of the portfolios or even after they've been announced, we still insist that each one of them must go for this training so that they can run their agencies effectively. Also, we are developing continually the capacity of permanent secretaries. We know that the job of permanent secretaries is not an easy one, and so we develop their capacities very often. I'd like to talk a bit about the lead P because I know a lot of questions will come from them. So let me just go into some details about what the lead P program is all about. It's, we, dis, we decided that it is certainly meaningless having the best people in service with fantastic skills and requisite experience if they are not deployed to environments where they can shine and make the best use of their talents. So we did, decided to look inwards and invest in programs such as the Leadership Enhancement and Development Program, which we call the Lead P. The Lead P has the goal of cultivating 100 officers on salary grade levels 10 to 14 annually as the next generation of leaders in the Federal Civil Service. The program is a key component, like I said before, of the first pillar of the FCP. The journey to having the lead P officers commenced in September 2020 with the first selection, very rigorous selection process. They had a, a selection examination, and then they had a second examination and a third examination because we had a lot of applications. So we had to go through three examinations to eliminate people that we thought um, will not go through the, the process. The final stage of the selection were interviews. Um, the exams and the interviews were held at the Public Service Institute of Nigeria. We started, we now were able to get um, 169, 169 candidates. However, um, only 123 candidates cutting across various professions finally emerged. And then the training, we had a total of 43 modules for their training. We had 17 generic and 26 sectorial modules, which we developed in-house also, working with um, PSIM, ASCON, and CMD. So it is a locally grown program. We developed the modules in-house. And after their lectures, we also had rotational postings, both within ministries and then to the private sector, just so that they would understand uh, what both every sector of government is working on and what the private sector expects of the public sector. We had some special lectures organized for participants as a way of acquainting them with critical governance and leadership issues. We had um, guest lecturers both from both within and outside the country. The Pioneer Batch had the privilege 
of having His Excellency the Vice President deliver a lecture to them titled Strategic Leadership, the Essential Skills. This event was held on the 13th of January of this year and we had minister, the Secretary of the Government of the Federation ministers that were in attendance. And so they had a training for seven months and the 100, after the training, some also dropped and finally we were able to get 118 in batch one of the lead P officers and they graduated at a very colorful event on the 10th of May 2022. The applications for batch two participants are opened and we've already started shortlisting for the second um, batch. You can see some of the pictures from the graduation ceremony of the lead P officers. And I must say that after the training, the lead P officers have become hot cake in service. Every MDA that has a project that they are running are applying to the office of the head of service that we should deploy these officers to them. So we have, and the essence also in addition to programs is that we want to discourage ministers, chief executive officers from bringing in essays from outside. We want to have a well-trained crop of officers that can serve that purpose and we already have 118 of them ready to work. On the Smart P training for grade level 7 and 17 in the civil service, as at today, we have trained 1,000 546 officers across um, the grade levels. And the induction training, we have also trained 1,751 officers. And you can see that all our trainings, most of our trainings, all of them really, are held at the Public Service Institute of Nigeria. That is for a reason. Then the training for the officers for conversion to planning officer, CADA, we've also concluded the first batch of training and we were able to successfully train 214 officers in collaboration with NISA. They acted, acted as our resource persons to train the planning officers and presently we have deployed them to MDs and the Federal Civil Service Commission is, has started the conversion from whatever CADA they were before to planning officer CADA. Also on this, we are, we are conducting assessment right now for candidates for the batch two training for planning officers. Like I said before, we have institutionalized annual capacity building retreats for permanent secretaries where total issues on governance are taken as case studies. We've had one on procurement, we've had another one on succession planning, we've done on culture orientation, and we will continue to have those retreats for permanent secretaries. It is also important to note that in addition to what the Office of the Head of Service is doing, we are also coordinating trainings at the MDA levels because you know that the ministries have various professionals that they must also train. So we are coordinating, we are ensuring that they, they present their training uh, plans for the year and we want to make sure that these trainings get the needed results. Um, we are discouraging trainings um, that go to Nasarawa State and insisting that all trainings now must be held at the PSIN so that we can monitor effectively and ensure that we get quality for even what the ministries are doing. The second pillar 
is the performance management system. You will all agree with me that you've heard over the years about the APA system and what the APA system is all about. Because we are not proud of the APA system, we thought that it's important to have a performance management system that actually rewards performance and not one where you will just fill a form and submit and one that is just for promotion alone. And so we have begun implementing an ideal performance management system. And various ministries, because this has been decentralized, various ministries are at different levels of implementation of this. It is worthy to note that some agencies have actually gone ahead of what we're doing in the ministries and have instituted um, performance management systems in their agencies. And we're working with them also. Um, we, we're working with um, the Road Safety FRSC. They are actually our partners um, in this process because they have worked on their own performance system and it is working very well. And we have also on, gone to study what um, these other agencies and states are doing so that we can implement it. So it's important for us to, to put this out there so that we will not think that we're trying to bring something new. Um, Lagos State has done very well. Ekiti State is also working on their performance management system. And so the center, the federal, cannot be left um, behind. The objectives of APA in the public service, like I said before, though noble at the beginning, but um, the implementation was very defective. And so it, the, it, the country was denied of the benefits that were derivable from a productive and performance output driven framework within which most public services in the world now operate. And so the journey began also in 2021, where we, the, the Mr. President had a retreat on the nine priority areas, and the institutional performance management was measured effectively, and it was open. And he gave the directive that the Office of the Head of Service of the Federation should institutionalize an employee performance management system in the public service to replace the APA. And so we got energized um, in the FCP to make sure we are able to achieve this. And so, we, so what have we done so far? We've incorporated the employee performance management into FCP. You can see that it has its own very prominent pillar. And then we started training, because this is something that is new in service, and we started by training officers to get used to the idea of what the new performance management system is all about. So we trained 1,900 officers um, in the phase one, and this cuts across all ministries in the phase one and two um, trainings. We also now have a policy, PMS policy, and guidelines that we have developed, circulated, and we've also had each MDA, you know, for us to monitor performance, each officer must have its job, is his or her own job objective. So we had um, seminars with the Chartered Institute of Personnel Management where every MD was taught how to develop, and every individual, how to develop their job, um, the, 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 how to do the job objective setting. And what this entails is that you look at the organizational 
um, objective and from that organizational objective every civil servant must derive his or her own targets indicators from the organizational um, objectives this would also give every civil servant a, a sense of belonging that they are contributing towards the overall objective of the organization also we've done um, the PMS guidelines have been incorporated in the revised public service rules which have been approved by FEC. We have also carried out service-wide development of standard operating procedures. We started from the office of the head of service where we developed our own standard operating procedures. Each department has their own standard operating procedures and because the, the staff of the office of the head of service were involved in this, they were the ones that now went out to all the ministries to train the staff of the other ministries on developing standard operating procedures. So for now, every MDA, every department of every MDA has their own standard operating procedures. We also, after that, we have the Office of the Head of Service has also gone ahead to be ISO certified. And by this week, the Office of the Head of Service will be declared as ISO 9001-2015 certified. This is so that we can also assess our own compliance with our standards. The ISO means that since you have standards, they will come and see if what you are actually doing aligns with your SOPs. And so we've also advised that all MDs should go on to the ISO certification. What we are planning is that by the grace of God, the whole of the civil service will become ISO certified. Like I said before, the implementation of the PMS has been cascaded to ministries with the permanent secretaries as top drivers in their MDs. And the directors of human resource management have also been sensitized to commence the process in their respective ministries. And the office of the head of service is monitoring what they are doing in the MDAs and any time they have hitches, they call on us and we go and see how to help and how to unravel whatever problems that they have. We are also working on the full automation of the PMS system. We don't want to go back to the paper-based forms. So we're telling MDAs that from the beginning the PMS system should be automated so that once whatever it is and why this is also important is that we want to ensure and to we want to make sure the standards are maintained and that whatever it is they are doing in the MDAs there's a dashboard in the office of the head of service where we can see and ensure that the proper thing um, is done we also have put in place um, modalities so that when there's a staff that does not agree with what his immediate superior has assessed. They can come to the office of the head of service and we will see it. what is the assessment. And we can call both of them together and ensure that there's an agreement. And this will be done quarterly. There will be quarterly reports on each individual. So that at the first quarter, second quarter, you are not doing very well. You would know, it will be clear to you that you are not doing um, very well. And we're also, it's, it's in the PSR where it says that if you attempt promotion three times and you don't make it, then you would um, leave the service. So we are going to reintroduce that also. It's already in the public service rules, but it hasn't been energized. That would be energized. And so now promotion will not be automatic. The, 
the, only, the people that the office of the head of service will recommend for promotion now will be those that have performed very well. So if you have not performed well, you will not be recommended to the Federal Civil Service Commission for promotion. So that will also um, limit the problem of vacancies um, that, that we have every year. In trying to achieve the laudable goals of our new performance management system, we are working with the Commonwealth Secretariat. Um, we, 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 have, uh, we have had several um, meetings and lectures with them. We had an online um, workshop where all permanent secretaries and all directors of human, I think all directors in service were asked to attend an online meeting um, organized by the Commonwealth Secretariat. And this was um, so that we would understand what our commitment for results would be using the general accepted, accepted principles and also um, we understood what government performance management system the whole of government, because it involves institutional and um, the employee part. We also had, like I said, a five-day workshop with the Commonwealth Secretariat, and it was very, very instructive because we were now able to see how the institutional performance management can be linked with the employee performance management in the whole of government performance management system, which must be driven from the top to the bottom in government. And after the workshop was when we cascaded, we insisted that MDAs should cascade the knowledge from the secretariat to the ministries, and quite a number of MDs have had retreats after we had um, the, the meeting. Now, the third pillar is the integrated personnel and payroll information system. But this is not the whole of the IPPIs. It's important for me to make the clarification that there are two parts to the IPPIs. There's a payroll which the Accountant General's Office runs and then there's the Human Resources part which the Office of the Head of Service deals with. However, at inception, the implementation of the IPPIS project focused mainly on payroll, which was not bad in itself because um, that also helped to block a lot of financial leakages from high personnel costs and also by the increased number of ghost workers that were on the payroll at that time. However, um, a gap was created which also caused a lot of problems. And so in 2013, the Office of the Head of Service of the Federation commenced activities towards the implementation of the human resource model of the IPPIS with a view of bridging the gap. Through these activities, which has been coordinated by the IPPIS service-wide service department, the office has achieved quite a lot. The first one, we, we, what we did at first, is that we discovered that newly recruited officers by the Civil Service Commission and those that were not recruited were being put on the IPPIS. And we, we had a number of cases where people that were not recruited by the Civil Service Commission were seen on the payroll of government. And so on the 1st of March 2021, we instituted a committee on enrollment of newly recruited civil servants into the IPPIs. And this step was decisive um, 
to control the mechanisms and correct the existing anomalies of the process. Um, before now, the, it was the Civil Service Commission that were enrolling new entrants onto IPPIs, and we said that was wrong. The Federal Civil Service Commission does not have any role in, a, in um, putting officers on IPPIs, and so the Office of the Head of Service put out a circular to say that every new, what the Civil Service Commission should do is to employ and then send the list to the Office of the Head of Service. Now it is the Office of the Head of Service that will ensure that the, the people that were recruited were the people that we need and also that they were recruited, recruited according to the waiver that was given by the Office of the Head of Service before they are now enrolled um, on the IPPIs and not only payroll enrollment, we also do human resource enrollment. We ensure that we get all their certificates in, in addition to the birth certificate at inception. We scan all those documents and put on the system so that those um, cannot be changed anymore. For avoidance of doubt, let me, because there's a lot of confusion on the process of waivers and recruitment in the public service. And so we had a meeting, the three major bodies that deal with recruitment, the Office of the Head of Service, the Budget Office of the Federation, and the Federal Character Commission had a meeting. The Civil Service Commission was in attendance at that meeting and we streamlined the process for recruitment. And we came out with a circular that actually tells us the process. Your first part of call, any agency of government that wants to recruit, the first part of call is the Office of the Head of Civil Service of the Federation, where you get a waiver for employment. And because there's an embargo on employment, that is scrutinized. It is only the, the, the exceptions that Mr. President has given that we look at and grant waivers to. And then once you get a waiver from the Office of the Head of Service, you now go to Budget Office of the Federation for a financial clearance to ensure that there's, a, there's enough money to pay the new entrants. And then the third step is to now go to the Federal Character Commission for a compliance certificate. So those are the three things that everybody needs for employment. And so the committee has been doing um, a lot of work to ensure that we don't have ghost workers on our IPPIs. And in the course of their work, they detected a total of 1,618 officers whose letters of employment were either fake or illegal. Thank you. And in addition to that, we also suspended 874 officers from the IPPIS platform because they had not up updated their records and had not gone through verification of their records. And so those officers were removed and assumed that they were ghost workers because we gave a period of about two years for officers to go and update their records on the IPPIS uh, platform. And so those who didn't um, go to do that, we assumed they were ghost workers. However, some of them have come up to say for one reason or the other they couldn't and we examine why they couldn't and when the committee thinks that their reasons are genuine enough, they are put back, uh, they are made to go through the verification and then they are put back on the platform, on the IPPIS platform. 
the, at the end of 2021, the Federal Civil Service Commission did carried out a verification audit of all employment letters of everybody that is in service and they wanted to compare the names on the employment letters with what they had in their own system. And they discovered that 3,657 workers did not present themselves for verification. So that means either they didn't have um, genuine letters or um, they disappeared and they didn't want to be <laughs> caught. And so um, we referred all the 3,065 workers to the ICPC and also stopped their salaries. In addition, the office has completed the IPPIS verification exercises for the core MDs. That means every civil servant as at today that works in a core ministry has been verified. We went to the six geopolitical zones to ensure that we were able to capture everybody and as at today we have verified 61,000 446 officers in the core MDs. So that means that anybody that is not part of this has been excluded and the salaries have been stopped. Although, let me also say that some people that either were on study leave outside of the country or were on foreign service at that time when the verifications were done in their MDs are coming up and we're looking at it, we're taking each case as it comes to verify. But the important thing is that most of the people that were put out of IPPIs have not even come. Only about less than 10% have come back to complain that their salaries were stopped. So we've been able to save government a lot of money from the verification of the core MDs. Meanwhile, the verification exercises for staff in non-core MDs, that is in the parastatals and agencies, we have started and we hope that by, we've actually gone round, is the mopping up exercise we're doing now. So by the grace of God, by the end of this year, we would have a clear and clean data on every public service servant, every public servant that the government is paying. The third pillar is the pillar on innovation. Fourth, okay, sorry, the fourth pillar is the pillar on innovation. For the first time in service, innovation is taking a very prominent place in the Federal Civil Service. And the Office of the Head of Service of the Federation is putting up structures in place to effectively support and sustain innovation in the system. In this regard, we have established a service innovation department in the office of the head of civil service of the federation and we also have inno service innovation divisions in the departments of reform coordination of all MDs. This is so that when civil servants have innovative ideas, it can be brought up to the fore. What we discovered before now is that young civil servants have innovative ideas, but unfortunately those ideas don't come up. Somehow within the system, those ideas are stepped on and don't get to see them. And so um, the divisions in the reform coordination departments of all MDs are supposed to collate what the MDs are doing so that we can get um, innovations from civil servants. The, 
Innovation Department also provides a platform for promoting and harnessing high-impact transformative solutions for the benefit of the service with major focus on reducing waste, cutting cost of governance, and enhancing revenue generation. We've had two editions of the Federal Civil Service Innovation Challenge. The first one was held between June and August of 2020. And then a second edition was held in December 2021 with a theme, Generate Revenue, Reduce Cost of Governance in the Federal Civil Service. The star prize for the last edition was a huge sum of 5 million Naira. And you can see the proud um, the proud uh, officer that you need her. <laughs> and we are also committed. And she has received, she didn't only get this check, she got her money in her account. We are committed to rewarding ingenuity and excellence in service so as to boost the morale of officers to enable them aspire to greater heights. And the, the competition does not just end here. Whatever ideas they bring up, we look at the innovation department, looks at it, and then we implement those ideas in service. So it is not just a competition for competition's sake. It's a, com it's a competition to harness ideas. And once these ideas come, we try to implement those ideas to improve um, our service. The fifth pillar is digitalization of our content in the civil service. In our modest quest towards the actualization of a technology-driven civil service, we explored and initiated partnerships for the deployment of an ECM platform. Hence, the Office of the Head of Service, in collaboration with Africa in Initiative for Governance, AIG, which is an independent, not-for-profit organization focused on driving public sector transformation in Africa, commenced work on preparing the service for the deployment of the solution. Achievements. It's also important for us to note that one of the key outcomes of this is that we have a culture change joint project with AIG to deliver digitalization in the office of the head of service. And we meet twice a month to ensure that we are on course in the development of the ECM solution. And we started the process to digitalization by reviewing what the ECMS operations and processes in the Office of the Head of Service and in all MDs. We also did a review of documented functional and technical requirements. What do we need for us to be able to achieve this? And then we did our SOPs. We developed uh, we issued a request for proposal for the selection of a vendor. And I'm happy to say that in the office of the head of service, we've actually selected a vendor which AIG is paying for on behalf of the office of the head of service. And the vendor has started work using the SOPs that we developed just last week. Um, we were told that out of the 357 processes identified in the Office of the Head of Service, they've been able to capture over 100 as at date, and they will capture all the processes. And so we are hoping that by the end of this year, we will not receive paper documents or files in the Office of the Head of Service 
anymore. And prior to this, we have digitized all our documents in the office of the head of service. We've scanned all the files. We've scanned the personnel files. We've scanned the program files. Just prior, we did all this last year prior to um, the digitalization. And I think it was on Tuesday we had a sensitization workshop for other MDAs. We invited the directors, reform coordination, ICT, human resource management of all the 35 MDAs to come and see what we have done in the office of the head of service and also to develop a roadmap for replication at the MDA levels. Because we discovered that most of the MDAs had put, a, had put procurement of a vendor before SOPs or before any other thing. And we know that that will create um, a lot of problems for them. And so we had that workshop and now we have a framework and step-by-step -step, um, guidelines as to what each MDA must do to also get to the stage we in the office of the head of service have gotten to. We are hopeful that by the end of 2023, almost all MDs will have compiled, complied fully and we would have gone digital in service. We also recognize that there are pockets of digitalization of some processes, but what we want to do is to ensure that in addition to those processes, we also, our workflow is also automated so that wherever you are, wherever you are in the world, anytime you have work to do, um, you can do the work and send back to the next person. Staff welfare is the sixth pillar. And this is basically enhancing value proposition for civil servants. And it is a key strategic um, objective of the strategic plan. And in pursuance of, the, of this, the office has initiated quite a number of activities. Um, what we have tried to drive the, the, the most important thing for us is to ensure that civil servants are able to acquire a comfortable accommodation before they retire. That is very, very important to us. And we doing this through the Federal Government Loans Board. Before now, the Loans Board was open to all public servants, military, and paramilitary, but in the last year, we have insisted that the loans board concentrate on civil servants because these other people have other avenues. The civil servants only have the loans board, and so that is what um, we have been doing based on the, the annual budgets that we get from the loans board. We have been able to facilitate mortgage loans for only 139 civil servants. We also were able to commission two housing estates which we delivered to civil servants. Um, and also we have some two projects, two um, big housing projects. We are working with PSI and we know the we, the, the land they have in PSI is enormous. So we're trying to cordon off a small part of it for housing for civil servants in, within this uh, Public Service Institute of Nigeria. That has gone um, a long way. I, I, I know that by the end of this year, we would have commissioned and work would have started. The problem we're having is making sure the houses are affordable. That is the biggest issue. That is why we're struggling and we're going slowly. But we, working with the loans board, we've said what we're going to do is to target the new entrants into service, 
who have a longer period to stay to repay because once you uh, you only have 10 15 years to go it's difficult to get a loan to pay and the the, lo the limits of the loan has also been increased because of the economic situation um, that we have right now in addition we have a five hectare land in guagualada which was allocated to the fish by the federal ministry of works and housing and we're actually set for groundbreaking ceremony there right now we actually wanted to do the groundbreaking ceremony during the civil service week but because of some logistics we couldn't achieve that but the land is ready we have also um, chosen the developers that we work we have agreed on the amount they are going to charge the civil servants and we are ready to go now we also because of the problem of funding um, or the the fish and federal government loans board we set up a committee to look for alternative sources of funding and to explore ways of finding alternative funding for the sustainability of housing for civil servants. The committee has identified two possible sources, has submitted their report, and we're looking on how to go ahead with those suggestions. And I'm sure that will improve the availability of mortgage loans to civil servants. We are also working on the Federal Civil Service Bus Scheme. This scheme is aimed at providing affordable transportation for federal civil servants in the FCT in collaboration with private sector operators. As at today, we have 20 high capacity buses which have been deployed in the pilot phase and they are running and there was a flag off of this phase on the 21st of June, 2022. Um, let me also say that these buses would, after the pilot phase, this particular provider would uh, go on to provide 40 buses. He has actually imported up to 40 buses for this scheme, and the buses are running on gas just to ensure that we are able to bring the cost down. We are also ensuring that it is not a cash-based transportation system. That means that you go to the Depart Department of Human Resources, purchase a card, and you can purchase a card for one week. Once you get your salary, you can purchase a card for one week, for one month, and you keep deducting. That is also to discourage people that are not civil servants from using because we want to ensure that it is just civil servants that are enjoying um, what we have put in place. We also have the inter entrepreneurship program <laughs> in place for civil servants. We've discovered that civil servants after retirement really don't know what to do with themselves and that is not a good thing we also discovered that when you want to start an agri business at the point of retirement it's already too late so the the agripreneurship program is for serving officers and then we have another program that is for prospective retirees. We are working with the Bank of Agri, the Federal Ministry of Agri, Water Resources, CBN, to ensure that the um, civil servants take farming seriously, and not just farming. If you don't, if you don't want to do the farming, we've also put it in the PSR that farming and its value chain, so you can decide which part of the value chain you are interested in. And, you know, the, the interesting thing is that farming now has gone beyond owning a large um, expanse of land. 
There are so many civil servants that are farming yam in their backyard in sacks that, are, that have small poultries at their backyard and so it is working. And we're ensuring that all civil servants should do something in addition to the work of um, being a civil servant. So we've worked and developed curriculum for all the programs. We have um, um, exhibition farms already that are working with us where they would go and receive training and things. So that we're doing and it's going very well. We're also rewarding, um, we also have a reward and recognition scheme in service. And this scheme is aimed at motivating workers towards increased productivity by linking high performance to rewards. The scheme has been institutionalized in MDs. I, uh, before now, what used to happen was that it was only during the civil service week that civil servants are being recognized. But as at last year, we insisted that every MDA must have a recognition and award week in their own MDA. They must recognize people in their own MDA. And then they will send us names of the best officer they have to the office of the head of service. And those are the ones that we recognize um, during the civil service week. And this year, we recognized civil servants with a bank. The, we had um, outstanding awardees that were recognized by Mr. President. And we also had a star prize this year, which was a mini SUV car. And it was donated by stakeholders from the insurance sector. And the, own, the, the, the winner of the car is a level 14 officer from the Ministry of Police Affairs. It's, uh, you can see him there standing beside the Minister of um, FCT that represented Mr. President at the award. In addition, we also got an endowment fund um, for these celebrations, whereby each officer that has been sent to the office of the head of service from their various MDs as best performing civil servants from the MDs got 500,000 Naira each. And this was donated by uh, uh, one of our private sector partners, the Aikimokode Foundation. And he started this year and says he would keep going. It's a foundation and so every year the top um, civil servants from all MDs will get half a million Naira. So we are also looking at the welfare of civil servants by ensuring that they have group life insurance cover. We have been doing that in the last um, two years. And not only that, we've also been looking at officers that died when there was no cover because sometimes um, we don't get money for the insurance cover, but when there's no cover, we collate the list of um, civil servants that died during that period, and we also pay them their entitlements. Last year, we got 2.5 billion in 2020, and which we paid to the beneficiaries, and this year, we're also paying over 500 beneficiaries for another two, with another 2.5 billion that we got from the Ministry of Finance. We are hoping that if this continues this week, in another four or five years, we would have been done with the backlog and there wouldn't be arrears um, to pay anymore. Conclusion, gentlemen of the press, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I wish to reiterate our commitment to continue to pay great attention to the development and welfare of all civil servants through their training, retraining, tooling, and retooling. 
as well as providing necessary facilities through some of the laudable initiatives, though some of the laudable initiatives have long-term implementation, but we are beginning to see effects, and we can see that what we are doing is contributing to the transformation of the Federal Civil Service. At this juncture, I'd like to once again acknowledge and appreciate all permanent secretaries in the Office of the Head of Service and indeed permanent secretaries service-wide. Without them, we wouldn't have been able to achieve what we've been able to achieve so far. I must not leave out the directors who are actually the workhorses in the service. They have all done very, very well, and I appreciate them for the work that they are doing. But I want to also promise that we will not rest on our oars, but with greater vigor we will rise to the challenge of evolving a new civil service of our dreams. For want of time, I just want to talk briefly on culture change and you can see that when the office of the head of service is wearing a new look, this is the reception in the office of the head of service and we also are working towards, can I see the workstations, transforming the workstations, the offices of, um, that was when it was work in progress, the offices, okay. We are also transforming the offices, the workstations of civil servants. We are transforming not only the minds of the civil servants, but even the spaces where they walk into. We have, I, I don't think he has a slide, but we've started work on the workstations also. And so I was saying that it's important for me to talk on culture change and effective communication, which have been identified as key enablers that will facilitate the successful implementation of the six pillars of the FCP 25. The service attaches much importance to culture change as a key enabler for value reorientation, as well as the reversal of negative public perception about the service. On the other hand, in the course of stock taking of previous reforms in the service, we were also able to identify that the total absence or poor implementation of a poor communication strategy impeded the successful implementation of these reforms. Therefore, in developing FCP 25, the office embarked on wide stakeholder engagement for buy-in and participation. We are also conscious of the role the media plays as critical segments of the community of stakeholders. Hence, we'll be looking forward to the usual overwhelming support from esteemed operators of the fourth estate of the realm to give the necessary support by sensitizing citizens and other stakeholders on the new policy thrust of government in service. As watchdogs and gatekeepers in society, it's important that you continue to see the service you render as an opportunity to safeguard the stability and sustainability of the programs of government, which are designed to bring about development and secure the well-being of Nigerians. Therefore, it is hoped that this ongoing partnership with the Office of the Head of Service will be sustained and enhanced in the interest of the nation. Before I go to sit, I'll just like us all to view a five-minute video on the new civil service. Thank you for your attention. Arriving late to work and performing poorly cannot help Nigeria's image and level of development. What we do and don't do matters. It's our duty to deliver public services. There may be times when we are asked to do things we know we shouldn't do, but if we fail to fulfill our duties in an ethical manner and with integrity, the public will say we suffer. It is not just when we neglect to do our work, it is also about the way we do our work. If we work in ways that are updated and inefficient, it will take a lot more time to do a lot less. We can't.
cannot continue working this way. We need to embrace technology and move into a digital future where work is faster and more efficient. We want to live in a country where everyone is treated fairly. a very wonderful presentation and for civil servants that are here I'm sure when I said I'm not sure the civil servants have had this good at least the presentation has justified what I say we don't usually clap for presenters but maybe because I'm a civil servant and my guy has just delivered the wonderful please. Please let's clap for her. Uh, we'll go to the question and answer session. And uh, please, I know you know Madame knows a lot of things. Madame also sits in FEC. She, she knows a lot. But please don't ask her how public servants aided or did not aid or did something about Kuje prisons. Security meeting is going on there next door. When they are through, you can ask them about Kuje and all of that. So please let us restrict ourselves to what she has spoken about. Who is firing? Ma, we'll take them in groups of four. It's a lady that presented. It's a lady that will start. Julie, AIT, John Bosco, and Leon, first group. Good morning, Ma. She needs to see me. She needs to see my face. Okay. Good morning, Ma. <laughs> my name is Juliana Tyro Balonia with the Sun newspapers. Um, I have just one question for you. In May this year, uh, ex uh, permanent secretary was billed for fraud, uh, over Shopee fraud. The second one, the same thing. And a lady, Pemsec, was also jailed um, for fraud. And then uh, currently the former accountant general has been investigated over fraud as well. So my question is, what makes it so easy for fraud to be committed on this large scale on the, in the service? And what are you doing to end this ugly trend? Morning, ma. My name is Yemi Adebayo from AIT. Uh, my question, my first question will likely throw the line. Okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay, I just wanted to find out basically uh, how much have the service been able to save from the verification exercise that you carried out on the core MDAs? I mean, the, for, the, for the verification exercise that was carried out, how much was saved from that exercise? I want you to just uh, give us figures. Thank you, ma. Here, yeah. good Emma. John Bosco Abakuru is my name. I write for Vanguard. Um, I want to repeat a question we asked you some time ago when you appeared here. It has to do with the dichotomy in BSC 
HND holders. I do know that the government, I mean the National Assembly, passed a law, you know, abolishing that dichotomy. What has been the development? Has it been abolished in the civil service? Thank you. Thank you. My name is Dr. Leon Sigwe of the Nigerian Tribune, Madam. Uh, you spoke uh, elaborately about um, the IPPIS. And as you know, Madam, the inclusion of uh, university lecturers in this IPPIS is um, a major motivation for the ongoing strike by university-based uh, unions. They have proposed the UTAS as uh, the preferred mode of paying uh, salaries to them. But uh, as we are told, the UTAS has not quite uh, lived up to billing. So, but uh, how do you think, um, or why do you think they are this head of uh, the IPPIS? Uh, how can their fears be assuaged? without the adoption of uh, the UTAS, so that uh, uh, they can end the strike and the children can uh, return to school. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. I'll also at this point say that um, I have very able and capable permanent secretaries here that I would refer um, some of the questions to. But I want to answer Madam Juliana um, the question on, on the permanent secretaries that were jailed. Um, you know the position of a permanent secretary and an accounting officer is a very, 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 very precarious. You know when uh, permanent secretaries are appointed, that's the first thing I tell them, that your position as permanent secretary is one that shouldn't be celebrated, is one that should make you become even more cautious. Because even when somebody else has committed a crime, it is the permanent secretary that will be held liable for that. That is what the Procurement Act has done to, to permanent secretaries. And we, we had a retreat, a procurement retreat. Um, you saw some pictures where that was talked about in very great details, where when even somebody else has committed a crime, I think it's called precarious liability. When even somebody else has committed a crime, it is the permanent secretary that will be held responsible. I'm not sure... Uh, that is how what the Procurement um, Act says today, and that is why we had um, those permanent secretaries. Because even the, the female permanent secretary, when the judge was, because we had to get the details of the judgment so that we could examine it and see where permanent secretaries should be more careful. And we saw that even the judge said that he didn't see the permanent, there was no intent to defraud government by the permanent secretary. But because the procurement act was not followed, you know, as it is stipulated, and as the Bureau of Public Procurement also wrote that the procurement act um, was not followed in details. You know, so those are the issues that um, we face, and the, my, my, the lessons, we, we are learning lessons from all those cases. I think that is the most important thing. When things happen, we, we should learn lessons from it and be more careful, and that is what we have done. We had a retreat where we, we dissected those judgments and we, we actually learned a lot of lessons um, from that. And I think the, the, the important thing is that, because I, I actually even spoke with, um, 
some of those permanent secretaries. And the impression they gave is that looking back now, maybe they should even have retired when those things were happening. It would have been much better for them than going through uh, um, all they have gone through. So we are learning lessons from all those things um, as a body of permanent secretaries. And the good thing is that the permanent secretaries we have today are not transactional permanent secretaries anymore. They are transformative permanent secretaries. And I'm sure that we will not have any of these problems with any of the permanent secretaries today. Yes, I, I think I should refer the, the one on the dichotomy to uh, PAMSEC service policy and strategy office, the, the one on abolishing Thank you very much. Um, we've been having several issues about this dichotomy like, between. Uh, we've been having several issues about this dichotomy between HND holders and BSC holders. First and foremost, we have uh, establishment rules within the service, where you have senior, middle-level manpower and the junior officer cadres. For one thing, all these cadres, they have their qualifications and also have their entry level and where they are supposed to end. For HND holders and BSC holders, they all start on level eight. That was what was agreed on. Now for you to move from one level to the other, you are supposed to acquire certain qualifications that will enable you to reach the height of your career. For HND holders, they are expected to stop at grade level 14, but for them to move beyond this to the senior level, starting from grade level 15 and above, they need a bridging program. Um, they are acquiring of what we call a diploma, plus a master's degree would take them to that. Let me also remind us that all these establishment matters are not the work of the head of the civil service alone. They are decided by what we call the National Council on Establishments, which is made up of the states, um, permanent secretaries of establishments, and their heads of service. We head of the civil service of the Federation as the chairperson. So they decide how establishment matters are decided for alignment of conditions of service within the civil service, Nigerian civil service. As whether there was a law or not, I've not seen the law. However, we had made representations to the National Assembly on the matter where we cooled down to explain these issues very well. Again, the parent ministry responsible for this is the Federal Ministry of Education. And we have all agreed that this is how it has to go. However, we should also look at entry qualification, the kind of uh, institutions that they have attended, the curriculum, number of years spent, and of course, the, let me use the word, value proposition after graduating. Now, if I'm a medical doctor and another person is an engineer, you find out that your scope of work is different. When you even enter the service, the levels are different. So these are some of the things we take into consideration in deciding, one, entry level, two, career progression, three, where you stop or where you continue from. And that is the situation now. It has not changed. And we want all of us to please help clarify this process. Most times, what you read in social media is not the actual thing. Like I said, first of all, if you want to move from grade level 14 and above as an HND holder, you need to do a preaching program. Acquiring a diploma and a master's will allow you to get to any level you want to get to. But without all this, and that's what we call a conversion process, 
So it's necessary. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think the question on um, the verification and how much uh, Pam said Career Management Office should please answer that. Thank you very much, Head of Service. Uh, you will all agree with me that the verification exercise that is being carried out by the Office of Head of Service is it cannot, it is not a one-time one activity. Every now and then, because of the way we are doing it, we still see some lapses. We see some people who we, who we still doubt the the genuineness of the appointment. So it's, it's an ongoing exercise. But as at now, the Office of the Service has been able to uh, put it mildly, save between uh, about 180 million per month, going to about 1.5, 1.6 billion every year. And the following year, we'll still see more. So it's a, it's a, the figure keep, keeps increasing. So it's in the range of uh, about 1.5 to 2 billion every year. And, but the Office of, of uh, Canadian Federation will be able to give a precise amount because they are, they are involved with the payroll. But from our own end, it's in that range of 1.5, 1.6 uh, to 2 billion uh, every year. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. The question on university lecturers and uh, the fears, what fears they have using IPPIs. I, I don't think it is fear, really. I think it's just that the university system is unique. There are some um, characteristics of the university system that is different from that of the public service. And it doesn't mean that IPPIs cannot accommodate that. We must understand that IPPIs started with the civil servants, and so it captured everything about the civil service. And I believe that as the lecturers come on to IPPIs, we would also be able to look at the peculiarities of the university system and apply such peculiarities onto IPPIs. So I really don't think um, there's, there's a major problem. I just think that we need to sit down more. We need to talk about those peculiarities more. And it is also work in progress. If we do something this month, it is not like you want it, you, you come back, we'll readjust until we get it right. That is what I think. Thank you. Second batch. Choji, silver board. Okay. The chairman says this is the last batch. So, we'll, okay, can I stretch it to six instead of four? <laughs> Whose turn is it? <laughs> Taloko. <laughs> TVC. <laughs> TVC one. Oh, Choji one. TVC two. Armed Forces Radio. Business Day. Two more. A lady. Rally at. Last person. Who gets it? Oh, yeah. Silver boat. Thank you, ma'am. My name is Timothy Choji. I report for Voice of Nigeria. I was excited when you mentioned the issue of the loans for the housing scheme for workers, especially those who are still in service. Uh, you don't know how far you've gone with sensitization of staff about this and what are the opportunities therein for them, because I was kind of shocked when I heard that only 139 loans have been granted so far. What are you doing, Ma, to up the numbers and ensure that more civil servants benefit from this? Thank you. Uh, 
right, thank you. Good morning. My name is On Denyinger from Silver Bear Television. Uh, my, in the course of your presentation, I noticed it's very silent on the issue of uh, persons with living with disabilities. So I don't know if there are programs tailored towards uh, enhancing their career within the service. Thank you. Hi. Uh, Thank you. Good morning. Yes, good morning, ma. Good morning, sirs. My name is Femi Akonde. I report for TVC News. Ma, uh, you talked about promotion, um, that promotion is no longer automatic, but based on recommendations to the Civil Service Commission. Ma, have you considered um, factors that may stall promotions for some deserving uh, civil servants like uh, nepotism, favoritism, and even political affiliations because we are beginning to see uh, an increasing um, level of um, civil servants getting involved in politics. And some of these things may uh, maybe one way or the other affect or actually for uh, line managers who are supposed to recommend um, deserving junior officers for uh, promotion. Have you thought of these as a challenge, man? Yeah, good morning, Ma. My name is Daniel Udi. I report for Armed Forces Radio. My question is very straightforward. Secretaries in the civil service say they are stagnated for so many years in, on grade level 14. Meanwhile, their counterparts in the National Assembly have been promoted to grade level 15. Are you aware of the situation and what are you doing about it? Thank you. All right. Okay. My name is Tony Lemon. I write for Business Day newspaper. My question has to do with the issue of the rationalization in the Federal Civil Service, which has been an ongoing issue for so many years. And I'm aware, Ma, that you are on that committee with the Federal Government uh, inaugurated not too long ago. What is the issue? What are, what are the issues that are making it so difficult for us to um, implement the Orosan Year report after so many years and is it possible for us to have the number of civil servants that uh, we have in the entire country? Thank you. Yeah, federal civil servants. Good morning. My name is Ralia Tadenekon from Classic FM and the Beat Abuja. Uh, okay. Sorry. Is it okay now? Okay, my question has to do with uh, clarification with regards to what you mentioned um, um, embargo on job in civil service. How true is this? Or maybe you need to clarify more on this. And what are you doing about job racketeering in federal civil service? Because a job as low as um, first entry is going for 750,000 naira in the job ma and racketeering market. And the big ones, maybe the CB and the NCC, is going for 1.5. What are you doing about this? Then what is the role of Servicom with regards to sanctioning Public, um, public servants to ensure that they are giving the best of services, then salary still also. Thank you. From the last um, comment, on, on embargo, on employment, and job racketeering. What I said was that um, for two years now, at the budget laying um, speech of Mr. President, he has repeated it that there's an embargo on employment. That means that um, you can't just in the civil service or in the public service, you can't just advertise um, for people to come in and apply and this. So that is why you need to get a waiver. And he also put an, uh, some exceptions. During COVID, he said uh, medical 
um, hospitals, teaching hospitals, medical centers, all those medical institutions should be given priority and be given waivers to employ. He also said that security agencies should be given waivers for employment. However, when there's a critical need, some institutions write to us that, look, we, are in, we render this service right now. We don't have anybody to render that service. And we look at it, we go there, we examine, we ask questions. Is that true that that particular kidder is missing or that particular profession is missing in that institution? And if the answer is yes, then we just give them minimal, a waiver of a minimal number just so that they can keep functioning. So that is what it means when I said that there's an embargo on employment. It, and I also said that in the civil service, the last time the federal civil service employed was in 2019 or 2018. Since then, we have not. The only people that come in right now are the people that have um, presidential, the people that serve and get presidential immediate employment. Those are the people that are coming into service right now. So if anybody is selling jobs to, of the civil service to anybody today, that person uh, is just wasting his or her money. But having said that, we also have seen people that try to come into the service illegally. We have seen, and I mentioned a case where one MDA for example, let me give a, a life example. One MD, I think it was 2018 or 2019, was given a waiver to employ 69. And the MDA employed over 1,000. Meanwhile, the waiver they got was just 69. And so we're insisting that go, MDA, go and do, undo what you did. And just bring, and that is what the committee, I mentioned that in, in early last year, there is a committee that is enrolling new employees. So that is what that committee is doing. Anytime anybody is newly appointed, they go through that committee. They will verify, they will write to the ministry, let us see your waiver. Do you have a waiver from the office of the head of service? If the answer is no. You can't even enroll that person. If the answer is yes, how many people were you given waiver to employ? How many people have you employed? So there are ministries like that that you give waiver to employ two. They go and employ 20. We, we don't enroll. We only enroll those two. We tell them to go back and send us the names of only the two people that they were given waivers to employ. So that committee has done a lot of work. But apart from that, the, the, we also discovered that unscrupulous people are coming into the service by posting instructions. You know, normally we used to do posting instructions by paper. That's why we stopped. So now the posting instruction is on our email. Directors of HRM are advised to download from the, uh, from the website, and we send it to them by email. Because you discover that if it is paper, you have posted three people to a certain MD, and then they can photocopy and add more names, people that are not civil servants. One officer in a ministry, I, I won't mention the name just to cover, came to report to me, he's a deputy director, that somebody has come for documentation. I've checked the, on, on, on a posting instruction, I've checked the website. The person's name is not there. What do I do? So we set both the person and the culprit up with ICPC, and they, 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 they arrested and discovered that that person that collected money from, from the innocent man was already on ICPC's name. They had arrested him before. He was out on bail, 
and he was still doing so you know <laughs> you we, we are doing all we can once we discover these things we report to icpc that we've discovered this number and recently just like you heard that pansex were jailed we also heard that one of the kingpins um, perpetrating this was also sentenced recently and it was icpc that prosecuted so we are even the the one of this ministry that employed more than was was we referred to icpc to deal with the civil servant that perpetrated that that act so we are trying from the office of the head of service to ensure that this does not happen but please if you know anybody who is asking for money for employment please let us know that is the important thing because if you don't report if you don't report to us how do we know and what i've discovered is that this information goes ah i bought you know somebody came to me also some some months ago and said ah madam uh, here um, civil service commission is employing and uh, please help. and i said civil service commission is not employed ah no unauthentic information they're employing i said it's not possible if civil service commission is employing i will know i'm the one that will give them when she said no you don't know what is happening <laughs> so, and you know what happens social media you just see it popping up a recruitment federal civil service commission and uh, this is the this is all a lie so we need to we need to be more careful and be more vigilant I wanted to go into details because we, we, on our own part, we're doing everything we can. When the um, commission sent us 3,000 names, we removed, stopped their salaries immediately. So each time we discover that, you know, some bridges have been, um, have been some processes have been breached, we stop the salaries immediately. But we need more information. And since you are pressmen, please help us. Let's work together. Um, the question on housing loans, I think PAMSEC Service Welfare Office um, should deal with that. The two questions, really, service, um, the loans and what we are doing with um, people, persons with disabilities. We are doing a lot with them, but the PAMSEC will talk about it. Thank you very much, Head of Service. Good, mon good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, the question said, how far with sensitization of staff in the housing loan? The fact is that the FISH program, when it was launched in 2015, was high, widely publicized. And in fact, on our database in the FISH, uh, FISH program office, we have over 30 to 40,000 applications. So actually, the sensitization is not the issue. The issue we have is access to affordable mortgage loans. Just like the head of service mentioned when she was uh, doing her presentation, it's only the federal government staff housing loan, loans, but that federal civil servants can access loan. Not that there are no other mortgage institutions, but the interest rates are very high. The, the, government, the uh, federal government staff housing loans board gives us mortgage loans at one um, single digit interest. And that's the only institution that civil servants can afford, going by the kind of salaries we earn and so, the, um, because of that, and that board services, probably until now, was servicing the whole of civil service, public service, paramilitary, police, everybody in federal government employment was servicing them. And they get their, their funding only from appropriation. So they don't usually get so much money. And so probably in a year, they may be able to just give civil servants about 15 or 20 slots, which I, I can even say that the 100 and... Uh, uh, 30, something we got from last year till now was a very huge success story. So if we have more uh, mortgage institutions, I can assure you that we have a lot of off cars on our database. That by the time, in fact, in one year we can even give houses up to 2,000 because the developers are there to develop houses, even at their affordable rates, but the access to affordable mortgage loans is a problem we have. Just like she mentioned that we are surveying alternative sources of funding. 
which we, if we're able to succeed in that, I can assure you that more civil servants will come on board. And as we, you know, clear the people at the database, we'll be publicizing for more people to come on board. Because there's no need capturing people and not being able to give them houses. So that's what I will say on that one. And then the persons with disabilities, we all know that the Disability Act has reserved 5% of every employment to people with disabilities. And I can assure you that if embargo is lifted on employment and MDA start to employ, we will make sure we stick with that, except if there, is, there are no disabled people, so the, the, the places will be filled. But as long as there are disabled people looking for employment, 5% is for them in every recruitment exercise. And uh, in the Office of Head of Service, there is a department called the Occupational Health, Safety, and Environment. It is under that department that will have the, the, the you know, a desk for disabilities. And that department has already even started to try to collect data because there's not much you can do if you don't have data. They've done one, one survey in MDAs within the FCT to even know, get to know how many di disabled people do we really have and categorize them. So these are what we are doing to at least be able to, if, when you have data on them, you'll be able to plan for them. Thank you very much. Also becoming um, friendlier. We are ensuring that there are ramps so that wheelchairs can go in. We are ensuring that even when there is no light, we have one elevator that runs on alternative power supply that they can use. So we are also customizing um, the secretariat to ensure that they can move around um, comfortably without um, much hindrances. So that's in addition to that. Um, I'll ask PAMSEC CMO to talk about um, promotion, nepotism, political interference. Yes, Mr. There, there are clear court guidelines on promotion. So, yeah, and that is what uh, the uh, Office of Service and uh, uh, the Civil Service Commission is, uh, they are, we are really working on. We have clear court guidelines, rules on promotion. And uh, uh, the issue of nepotism, I think, is not in, is not in service. It, I, I don't think uh, when you are conducting promotion examination, the issue of nepotism, got, there are rules, there are areas you must satisfy. We have we a have guideline on how to conduct the promotion exam. You have the guideline on how to accredit you. So everything is laid down. So the issue of nepotism in promotion in civil service, in the civil service that, that I know of, I think it's just, it's just people imagining it or people just finding excuses for their, for, for, for their uh, inability to make, make, make up. It is not, it does not put you in, uh, in uh, if, because I have, my, I have my son or I have my brother, uh, it's not possible because there are clear lines. You must call up to this level because you are, you are promoted. It's also applicable in all other areas where you have to move up, even in uh, upgrading, in, in uh, everything it is, there are, there are rules. So I don't think, I think it's just, it's just as uh, uh, absorption or a way of giving yourself a leeway that uh, you are failed, you are failed. But you are just trying to just say, uh, because um, I don't know somebody, it's not, it's not applicable in, uh, in a civil, civil service. And I, I have not seen any, any evidence. People just say it, but, I, but there is no evidence. So it's, it's not there in civil service. Thank you. Also, the new um, performance management system is even if you, we, you assume that that kind of thing happens before, the new performance management system will eliminate all that because if you don't perform and your immediate superior, your head of department signs off that you have performed very well, the office of the head of service will not recommend you to the Civil Service Commission for promotion. So with that new system, it further strengthens the fact that it is only people that have done well that would be um, sent for promotion. So that, for me, 
that is clear. And on a lighter note, you know, what uh, Pam Seksimu said is very true. You know, we conduct exams um, of directors to become permanent secretaries. And there's nothing I have not heard about that process. Sometimes someone says, ah, is the, the, last, the last process was actually the most interesting. Um, at the beginning of the process, um, they were saying, ah, how come there is only Christians that are passing? And then I now, somebody had the guts to come to me and say, ah, madam, how come? So I said, have you looked at, have you examined this thing thoroughly? He said, yes, uh, even the person from this state is a Christian. I said, what about the person from Cross River State that didn't even cross to the ICT? What about the person from Taraba State that is a Christian that didn't pass? And I said, ah, okay, nobody told me about that, you know. So, like he said, when somebody sits for an exam and doesn't pass, he has to look for an excuse other than the fact that he has not done well to, to give an excuse so that people will believe that it's not that he's not good, but it is a system that is bad. And we're trying very hard to educate people that, look, if you are good, the system will bring you up automatically. If you are not good, go and improve on yourself. For me, that is a message to, to, to civil servants. Nobody is born very good. But we can all improve on ourselves to become much better than who we are today. Um, the PAMSEC SPSO again will deal, it's similar to the um, HND thing, but he will deal with the secretary thing that has stagnated. It. Okay. The Career progression in the service is determined by what we call the schemes of service. So this tells you the entry qualification and career progression of all the cadres within the public service. It's called schemes of service. For secretarial cadre, the terminal point is grade level 14. Now, if you acquire additional qualification and you want to move up, you need to change that cadre to under. In other words, what you are doing is not the secretarial function alone. You must have an added function, in which case we look for an appropriate cadre for you, for you to cross above level 14. If you are doing any other thing, it's against the law, and it's not in line with the schemes of service. Thank you. Thank you very much. And also, there are some professions that on their own upgrade their profession. I'll give an example of the nursing profession. Before, the nurses were just um, were in the same, um, yes, RN, RN and RN, a registered nurse and registered midwives. But the profession itself now looked inwards and said, no, let's improve on ourselves. And they started degree programs, BSc nursing. And so now, the, some people that had RN, RN are now going for BSc nursing so that they can progress. Some are going directly to do the BSc, BSc nursing and they have their own career path different. So it is, it is not the office of the head of service that says you must start and stop somewhere. It is your profession. And so if you want um, to progress, the profession should come together and do something about the entry point and it will reflect on the exit point also. The last point we need to talk about is the Oron Sonye um, panel and what is happening. You, you recall that I think about two or three weeks ago, um, the, the, there were two committees that submitted their reports to the SGF um, on the, the Oron Sonye committee. What happened was that two committees were set up to look at things that what we can do about the Oronsoye um, committee report itself. But because the Oronsoye committee report is old, we also had a second committee that looked at the new institutions that have been set up 
even after the Oron Sonye um, committee report. So those two committees have concluded their work and have submitted their report to the Secretaries of the Government of the Federation. What is happening now is that there is another committee that is drafting the white paper. It is until the white paper comes out that action will now be taken on the Oronsoye um, report. On the number of civil servants, you didn't watch when I was um, presenting because there was a slide. Um, go to it, the IPPI slide 66. Yes, that we said we had verified 60. Uh huh. So you see, my people who are listening, you are not listening. <laughs> so let me go back. Can you see? Eh? 61,446 officers have been verified in the core MDAs, that is in the ministries. And we are also working on the parastatals agencies. And I said by the end of this year, we would also have a certified number of the number of public servants that we have. You know there's a difference between civil servants and public servants. This is the number for civil servants. But we are working, thank you very much, Uchi. We are working on the final figure for the parastatals and agencies. Thank you, ma'am. Mr. Chairman, just before you uh, round up, um, we have, let's just take a few comments from some of our online viewers. A, one principal information officer is saying, congratulations, head of service, for the civil service reforms. A nickname says, your presentation is quite beautiful. Then a, hmm, one of our guys now, a Festus, is a journalist. He says, good afternoon, ma'am. Please, does due process amount to delay and sluggish execution of files and other civil service procedures because the level of man hour delays in the service is alarming? I think that's oh, another guy tried to sneak in a question. He has already asked one, and I won't take it. Okay, thank you very much. On the due process, does it actually slow things down? No. Due process is meant to ensure that you do things properly and in line with laid down procedures. It doesn't mean um, there must be a delay. However, when due process says that you must put an advert out, let's take the procurement process, for example, that your advert must be out for six weeks. You have to wait for the six weeks. There's nothing you can do, even if the officers are anxious to open the bids. Once the law says it has to be six weeks, it must be six weeks. And we are also, at the procurement retreat, we looked at all those things. And we're looking at ways by which we can shorten these, some of these processes that we think are too long. The six weeks was just there for everybody to see the advert and apply. It wasn't meant for it to drag on. It's just for everybody to have an opportunity. Um, but now that we have various means of advertising. It doesn't have to be the dailies in, uh, only. We have tenders journal. We even have things online now. I think we can shorten some of those um, processes. So it's not, but having said that, um, even what we're also trying to do with the digitalization, it, sometimes manual processes take long. You can, you, that, there's, there's no running away from that. Sometimes manual processes take very long, and that is why we're saying that the service should go digital, so that at the press of a button, you can look at your file within two minutes, send it back to your superior, send it back, and, or send the letter to the ministry or to the person that is asking 
for, for answers. So in, in the process, I'm sure that by the time all our processes are automated, um, we will eliminate every form of delays. Thank you. I think I've answered. All. Okay. Well, at this point, it's just to say thank you to everyone here. Let me start with the delegation that came with the head of the civil service of the Federation, the four permanent secretaries of um, SPSO, CSO, SWO, and CMO. Thank you very much for coming and uh, giving further clarifications to some of the questions. There are a number of directors, deputy directors, and assistant directors here. You are also all welcome. But let me single out our own kindred spirit, our kinsman, <laughs> who is the deputy director in charge of uh, information. Assistant director, no, it's a deputy director, Mohammed Ahmed Abdullahi. That's our own. So he has special treatment. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, Dr. Abdelkariyo Obato Ivo is the administrator and CEO of the Public Service Institute of Nigeria. Yes. You're welcome. Okay. The DG has gone. Oh, all the way from Badagri. Yes. Oh, you are welcome. You are welcome. You are welcome. So we thank all these people that came with the head of the civil service of the Federation. Then we also want to thank the media people. If we put this together and you are not here, it will not be complete. Thank you for coming and thank you for reporting with fidelity. I know that <laughs> I know that the end of the civil service does not have cause to say no, I was misquoted. I know you will quote her very well. Thank you very much. And madam, thank you. You now know why she was the best graduating student in Europe. <laughs> so Thank you very much for coming. We hope and believe that if we have cause to invite you again, you will still oblige us. Thank you very much. Welcome and uh, enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you.